extra 30 minutes, right? Not bad. Uh, welcome. Obviously, I know uh, most of us are aware that uh, Les Green, who was a CBM alum of 09, had to cancel last minute. A um, couple of silver linings with that, though. Number one, we're going to get Les rescheduled, hopefully, for next semester. Number two, for those of us who may not know Catherine as well, we got to see firsthand just how hard she works for us and everything she does for us, because I think in the same hour she got the news that Les was canceling and then also had a replacement speaker. So that's pretty awesome. So shouts to her. Today's speaker is Luke Rabin, co-founder of Builder, a uh, local company out in Church Hill. Uh, they help tech companies uh, bring new products and ideas to market. Um, he was just telling me how busy he is and that business is, is good. Uh, Finally. That he, that he appreciates that uh, he gets time to come and talk to us, and we certainly appreciate you coming along. So help me welcome Luke Rabin. Sorry, I didn't get, didn't get a chance to look up uh, uh, last, but Luke said that he works at Nike and sounds really cool. Um, so instead of a super creative juggernaut like uh, him, you get a guy with goofy long hair and a cold. So it's going to be awesome. Um, so uh, like Luke said, my name is Luke Rabin. Um, uh, we started a company called Builder um, up in Churchill. And we don't make ads, we don't make marketing campaigns, we make tech companies. Um, and it's been quite the experience. Um, and so, I just need you to trust me on this, it, in that going to, going to the market and saying, hey, let me make your whole company for you. Um, it's not a really good value prop to take to market. Um, it's really not. Um, and, uh, but what we put together, uh, we had a really good reason. Um, because uh, we've had, I'm sorry, I don't have any of my notes, but, um, so we had um, the rare privilege, Brandon and I, so Brandon right there, co-founder, um, the rare, rare privilege of uh, working at some of Richmond's biggest startup failures, um, which is a super great resume uh, item. And um, it was quite the experience. Um, but it was an experience that not many people get to have. Um, because generally, if you're in the early stage of a company and everything goes well, um, you're rich beyond your wildest dreams. And if it doesn't go well, you'll never do it again, because it's the worst thing that you've ever done in your life. Um, so for some reason or another, we kept doing them um, and working in heavily funded startups and going down with the ship and learning way too many lessons the hard way. Um, and after um, too many sleepless nights, like shortening your life expect expectancy by the massive amount of stress you get used to, um, you, you kind of stop asking questions like, if we had only done this, if, if we only had that, this is, this is a, a post-mortem of of uh, the 20 reasons uh, why startups fail. So if, if we only had more money, if we only had uh, done more market research, uh, if we had only hired different people, then we would have been successful. Um, so you kind of stop asking that question, um, what could we have done? And you just start asking the question or feeling that there's something seriously wrong with this whole thing. Um, because whether you know it or not, like nine out of 10 startups fail. Um, I would say it's closer to 95 or 99 out of 100. Um, maybe the, a, a lot of the ones just don't die, but they don't become successful. Um, but it's, it, when you do it too many times, it feels like a rig game. Um, and so we had all of this reason to figure out, can we do this some different way? Um, because it, it's it's a it's a it's a bad gamble if you're you're just gambling on nine out of ten, um, and it's it's a it's something we've got to be really bad at if we fail at it ninety percent of the time. So we kept digging into um, there's something got to be really wrong, and so when we came up with this idea and said, hey, person who has a company that they want to start, pay me with the money that you don't have. Uh, to start the company for you that you want to start yourself. Um, that's kind of 
not a great idea, um, <laughs> but it works. Um, and it's working really well. Um, Luke was saying we've been in, uh, um, in project mode for a long time. Uh, we started Builder uh, like 18 months ago. Uh, you would have no idea how much credit card debt is in this wallet right here. Um, but it's working. And it's working really stinking well. Um, and so what we're going to talk about today um, is why it's working. Um, and we're going to be digging into this question. Why do smart people make bad decisions? It's a, it's, it's a weird, heavy question. Um, but it's an important question. Because I, I cannot make it clear enough that the companies that we work with were the most insanely talented people, the, the most gifted, the most trained, the, the most prestigious people I, I may ever get to work with. Like It was humbling and inspiring to be on teams with them. Um, but we failed it, 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 in big time. Like many tens of millions of dollars have failed. Um, and it all kind of comes down to why did we, these smart people, um, make these bad decisions? Um, and so that's why, um, oh, what the bad decisions sound like, uh, I will kind of encourage you on, is it's not like, hey, we're going to go raise our next round of funding. Uh, by going to Vegas and taking all of our money and gambling it. Um, that's, that's not what a bad decision in a company sounds like. It sounds more like, hey, let's push the deadline of our V1 so we can be first to market. It sounds really smart. Um, but given the context of the decision, it may be a terrible, lethal decision. Um, and it's all about the context of the decision. Um, so what we're going to dig into with that question about decisions, we're going to use behavioral economics. Um, and so um, economics, if you, if you don't know before, I studied economics, I thought it was a study of money. Um, but really, it's a study of shortage, the shortage of time, the shortage of energy, um, or the shortage of money. Um, if you only have so much of something, you have to make a decision. So economics is a really great way to dig into why do we make decisions. Um, good ones and bad ones. Um, and so a little bit of background on me. Um, I went to UVA as a backup plan for music, hence the stupid long hair. Um, and uh, I, I, I meant to be a biology person. Um, and I got really sick of lab reports. So I, I thought econ was kind of similar in the, in the, the systems. And so we, uh, yeah, it, it, was, it was a, it was a great experience. And then I went straight into the music industry afterwards um, and kissed that econ degree goodbye. Um, but uh, it was incredibly inspiring and became an amazing lens to look at the world and look at these problems through it later. Um, so I'm going to take you all the way back to Econ 101. So does anyone here know what this mythical creature is called an econ? Uh, it's a noun. Has anyone heard of an econ? No? OK, so let me uh, explain to you what I s see in my head when I think of econ. I think of these people. <laughs> um, so these mythical creatures, where everything is amazing, they make all of the right decisions, they know everything, and everything is great. These are econs. And for 300 years, um, in all classical economic models, they were all based on the assumption that the world were filled with these. And the funny thing is when you get into economics, there's a lot of, uh, a, a lot of the smart things or the, the big answers kind of feel like no-duh answers. Um, and so when something like this pops up, you're like, really? Like, there's there's got to be something going on here because that's not me. Um, so the description of these people are two parts. One, they're perfectly informed, meaning they have all the information that they'd ever need to make a decision. And two, they're perfectly utility maximizing. And what I mean by utility is 
Uh, utility is value, it's pleasure, it's happiness. And so given all of the information, people are always going to make the perfectly rational right decision to make themselves happiest or make their lives the best. And so um, what, is, what, what do classical economic models say are the root of bad decisions? Because we just didn't know any better. Um, that we didn't have all the information. Um, and this is called asymmetric information. It's, it's, just a, um, it, it's just a fancy term for, I don't know. Um, and, but that's, that's how the stock market runs and all, all different kinds of things. Um, is that the stock market is built uh, on the assumption that every price has every bit of publicly available information built into it. Um, so, um, the answer to these problems is education. You don't know, you don't have all the information, so let me tell you. Um, let me make sure that you have all the information you'll ever need, then you'll make the right decision. Um, so, just to kind of give some context here, let's dig into a couple uh, big problems that uh, we've kind of tried to solve. Uh, so let's look at drug addiction and type 2 diabetes. Um, so in bad decisions, we, th we think of drug addiction as um, one bad decision that opened your life to these extremely powerful chemical hooks that suck your life down the tubes um, and now you're a drug addict. One bad decision. Whereas Something like type 2 diabetes uh, could be the sum of a lot of small bad decisions. Um, what, what do you eat? What do you drink? Um, all, all that kind of stuff. And so how, uh, in the classical view that the problem is education, how have we as a society approached these types of problems? Education. Um, so do you guys remember the D.A.R.E. program? Is that still a thing? Yes. Um, so don't do drugs. Um, and in the food pyramid and lots of nutrition education. Um, but how would you guys say we're doing with these problems given that kind of model? Yeah, not so good. Um, and so um, the reason is the people in this picture do not exist. Econs do not exist. The world is not like this. Um, the world is not full of people that always make the right decision and always um, make themselves happiest or always make the people they care about happiest. Um, we're, we're imperfect. We're broken. Um, and so when it comes down to how do we create a no-duh um, model around kind of the no-duh of these people don't exist um, and they're not perfectly informed, and they're not utility maximizing, we'll fast forward and meet behavioral economics. Um, so behavioral economics, the only thing that you need to know, and we'll stay high level, is that the big change is that one thing about econs, is that, the, that people are predictably irrational. Um, we do dumb things and kind of have some common reasons for why we do dumb things. Um, but those things are, um, they're measurable and they're, they can be consistent. So these are all these different quantifiable, um, tested principles in, in behavioral economics that uh, dig into why do we make decisions that are not perfectly utility maximizing, that don't make us um, as happy or make our, our, the world as good as it could be. Why are we selfish? Um, so it may be something like a time discount. Um, so you say, uh, I, I give you $100 and you can either uh, spend it now or save it later and get a higher return on interest or, and, and do whatever you want with that money. Um, I mean, the smart thing, the, the utility maximizing thing is just wait. Um, but you kind of want to spend it now. And you might want to spend it on something kind of stupid. Um, but that's, that's, that's one of many of these things uh, that dig into why do we make decisions that are not always perfectly rational. Um, and so if I could um, change your mind about one thing today, it would be this. 
So if we can't rely on changing the content of the decision, meaning having all of the information, then we have to think about changing the context of the decider. What that means is we need to change the environment, both internally and externally, in which we're, we're putting people in these extreme situations um, to help them help us make good decisions. Um, and it's, it's quite a challenge. Um, so um, the one thing I'll say is education is unbelievably important. Unbelievably important. Um, like business books and startup methodologies and um, all kinds of things are incredibly important. But remember, asymmetric information is only half of the problem. It's a big half of the problem, but it's half of it. Um, and so we need to think about redesigning the context of how we make decisions. Uh, remember the, what I was saying in terms of the, what sounded like a smart decision. It's the context of that decision um, that could make it a terrible decision. Um, so let's talk about one of my favorite decisions to make, to kind of put these, these things into context. Let's talk about lunch. Um, so if I were to choose something to eat today for lunch, um, what should I choose? Salad or, or hamburger? Burger? Look at me. I could use, lose some weight. I didn't eat a salad. Um, I, I'm 32. I've got a, I've got a, I've got a daughter. Um, I got to take care of that girl. Um, so I should eat a salad. I should not die of a heart attack. <laughs> Things that, that you worry about when you get out of school. Um, so I should eat a salad because it has better macronutrients, it's lower calories. Um, it's better for me. And I mean that that burger is filled with. Uh, Salt, fat, and, and carbs is going to clog up my arteries. Um, and really looking forward to quadruple bypass surgery. Um, so I should eat a salad. But let's put that decision into context. Um, so think, I'm, I'm driving to a meeting. I've got 10 minutes to get there. I feel like I'm about to pass out. And my god, I need to eat something. Then what am I going to decide to eat? Hell yeah, I'm eating the burger. Um, I'm, I'm driving through, and I'm eating in the car. Um, so it's not necessarily the best decision for me. Um, and a, a, it's a poor decision I make very frequently. Um, but it's, it's the decision that I'll make. Um, so let's, let's talk about one more. Um, let's talk about an easier one. Should you or should you not start doing heroin? No, you shouldn't. Um, pretty easy one, right? Um, but let, let's put that decision into context. So, the Vietnam War was absolute hell. It was young kids going to a faraway place, far away from the people that they cared about, and in terrible, terrible conditions, um, experiencing terrible, ter terrible things. And when they came home, one in six, one in six uh, young soldiers that came home, came home heroin addicts. Um, it's, it's crazy, right? Um, that's one in six. Um, and so, I mean, they were far away and they had, had to find some way to cope um, with the hell that was surrounding them. And one in six became heroin addicts. Luckily, they didn't all stay heroin addicts, but that's a different talk. There's, TED talk on it, actually, which is really cool. Um, let's talk about the third one. This is a little bit more relevant. So uh, say you've got this great idea uh, for a product. Should you validate the market first, or should you just create the product? Validate the market. Yeah. I mean, that, that, that sounds like the rational thing to do. Um, it, it's, it, it's in the books and things like that. Um, but let me put that into context. So say you've been working in a certain industry for 10 years, and you experience this problem every day. 
and you're dying to fix it, and you've spent a year thinking about your idea, um, and you've got friends on board, and everybody's excited about this product. Um, the flip side is if you were to validate the market, you have to talk to people. You have to listen to the market. Um, you have to actually gather data and possibly change your decision based on that data. So you may not get to do the cool thing that you wanted to do. You have to throw away that year of time that you've been uh, crafting your idea at home. Um, and you'd have to tell your friends, hey, sorry, like, there's just nothing here. I thought there was something here, but there's not. Um, so in that context, what are you going to do? Yeah. You just got to make it. And you're going to launch it. Because it's cool. Um, I mean, that's, that's what... Um, that's what the real world context that we run into every day um, with people that have amazing ideas, um, like objectively incredible ideas. Um, but even at that very, very beginning, there are seeds of, of these, these forces, these behavioral economic forces that pull us in directions that may not be the most rational direction to go. Um, so, coming back to this, how can we redesign the context of starting something? Um, because I know, I know not all of you are going to uh, dive into a startup, um, but you may freelance, um, or you may be inside of a company um, and be tasked with creating something from nothing, um, like a brand new product or a brand new initiative for, for a new market. Um, and this is, this is the place where we, are, we love, um, the, the kind of the wild west, um, and, and how do we bring structure to those really chaotic and really exciting first days. Um, so before I get into the context, um, from, from y'all's kind of life experience or, or what you know about starting something, how would you describe the context, the setting uh, that that you experience when you're starting something. Unfamiliar. Unfamiliar. Fast pace. That one more time. Fast pace. Fast pace. Yeah. A little hectic. Not a little. A lot hectic. <laughs> exciting. Yeah. Exciting. Anxiety. Yeah. Lots of anxiety. Anyone else? Yeah, so I think in all the experiences we've had, um, I, would, I would apply all of those things. Um, you're dead on. Um, but in terms of the challenge at hand, and kind of how we frame the problem, because that's, that's kind of one of my favorite ways of dissecting a problem, is, is really how, how are we thinking about it in general? Um, like, are we thinking about it as, um, like, the way you start a business is just watch the social network and do what Mark Zuckerberg did in that? Um, I mean, that's one way of going about it. Um, or, or is there a different way? Um, so I would describe it in four conditions. So first, the end goal uh, at hand is incredibly ambiguous. Um, there's, there's no real finish line. And what does it look like to create a successful company? What is success? Is it money? Is it happiness? Um, what, what is that goal that you're chasing after? Um, the second one is the path to get there is completely unknown. There's no, there's no map. There's no rule book. Um, and so you can see kind of What's, what you're hoping to find on the other side, but there's no, there's no clear way there. Um, in the startup world, we call it wayfinding. The third one is the journey is super stressful, unbelievably stressful. It gets even more stressful when you get more people involved um, because they have expectations. You may get money involved, um, and you just wind up in this, um, wind up in this ball of I'd call it like the sunk, sunk cost fallacy. If you've done so much together, um, how could you ever throw that away? Um, and so it's, it's just, I, I, it's stressful. Um, and the last one is the cost of failure 
is super high, like super high. And so this is not, this is not just like, ah, crap, I, I had my life savings and I, I lost $10,000. It's like, oh my God, everybody thinks I'm an idiot. Um, oh my God, my, my family members, um, like I owe a ton of money to them because I borrowed it and I pissed it all away. Um, like maybe everybody in my community that I was, I was hyping up to, to show this, they now just think I'm stupid um, because, or I'm a liar. Um, it, I mean, that cost, I would say, is way higher than any monetary cost. Because um, you, can't, you can't get that back. Um, and so it's super high. Um, and so one way that we like to dig into um, problems like this, in if, if we're seeing the problem, how do we create a different model, is zooming out a little bit um, and ask, has anyone encountered those types of conditions? Um, those extreme conditions um, and gotten a higher than 10% success rate. Um, and so one, one good way is to kind of jack up the cost of failure um, and see, okay, what would, what would, how do other people prepare? Um, so one, how do surgeons prepare? Um, surgeons, the end goal, just make me better, um, fix me. Like that, that's pretty ambiguous. Um, the, the path to get there, they don't always know. Like when I, I, I've had seven wrist surgeries and I had to, one time I had to authorize like three different surgeries before they uh, did it because they didn't really know what was, what was going on. And so they're like, all right, we're gonna cut you open, take a look, and then we might do one thing, we might do another thing. Um, and so there, there isn't always a clear path. Um, the experience is stressful. It doesn't ever, always go to plan. I mean, you've seen TV where the, the heart monitor starts freaking out, um, and the cost of failure is ridiculously high, uh, ultimately high. Um, so that's surgeons. So what about, what about soldiers? Um, so soldiers, they have to win, uh, defeat the enemy. How do you do that? I don't know. Um, and so the path to get there, you don't always know what someone else is gonna be doing. Um, so that's incredibly undefined. Um, is war stressful? Yes. Um, is the cost of failure high? Absolutely. Um, so, um, this, if you guys have seen Saving Private Ryan, this is kind of the perfect summary of what the, the kind of startup experience can feel like. The anxiety, the stress, the fear, and just being absolutely overwhelmed. Um, and this is, not, uh, this is not what we want to produce. Um, we don't want to create uh, a, a, a group of founders, a group of, of young, hopeful freelancers that look like this um, when you go take on a challenge. You want it to look more like this. You, know, you want to feel confident. You want to be on a team. Um, so here's the big question. How do we set up uh, surgeons and soldiers uh, to make good decisions in extreme conditions. And so, first one, one clue, is they, they practice when the cost of failure is really low. Um, so, surgeons, they do tons of, uh, of, of drills and, and, and practice surgeries, they work on cadavers, they do simulations, um, because they have to practice everything. Not just, how do I do the same thing over and over again, but how do I practice for the, the unexpected, the terrible situations? So that's, that's why, why soldiers do live fire drills. And they rehearse the bad things that are gonna happen, the unexpected things that are gonna happen, or that might happen, um, so that they're never ill-prepared, um, because it's a way of preparing for the assumption that nothing will go right. Um, so how do you prepare for nothing going as you expected? it becomes more of a skill set than like a rehearsal, a toolbox, um, rather than just a script you run through. Um, and the second one, because this is kind of hard to come by in, in kind of startup, freelancy, uh, side hustle world. Um, I mean, other than like doing maybe an internship or something like that. But the second one is, is more practical. Um, 
They also follow veteran leaders. Um, this is super important and this is super practical. Um, I always say uh, entrepreneurship is a team sport. Um, it's a team sport, it's a team sport. Um, why? Because um, when you look at surgeons or soldiers um, in these extreme conditions, you don't just dive straight in. Um, you, you have someone to turn to because you've maybe built up muscle memory in the training, um, but you, there may still be something that you didn't train for. And so you have to look to someone. You have to have someone next to you, not someone to call. Uh, you have to have someone to grab the scalpel out of your hand, someone to drag you in the right direction. Like that's leadership. That's not, that's not mentorship. That's not um, advising. It's leadership. Um, and we need veteran leaders to follow um, because it's just, we, we get used to all the chaos. Um, and as you get used to the chaos, you can help other people who are just jumping into the chaos for the first time and are absolutely terrified. Um, so, like I was saying in the beginning, this is, the builder's kind of working. Um, the, hey, can we ask, uh, can we ask you to let us start your company for you and uh, you pay us money that you don't have uh, to do something that you want to do yourself? Um, so why, why is this working? Um, given the, the kind of context of, we're really trying hard to redesign the context in which people have all these uh, decisions to make and these challenges to overcome. So how do we do this at Builder? Um, so one, we count ourselves as practitioners, not as consultants. Um, so yes, we are, uh, we're contractors, we, we charge a fee, um, but it's in a very different model. So um, when we work with people, it's not, they're not buying our time and our talent. Um, they're buying outcomes, um, and that is scary as hell. <laughs> like, to, to put yourself on the line for, I'm, I'm not gonna just uh, be smart, and if, if the, the company tanks, it tanks, not my fault, it's your company. Um, we, we dive in, and, um, and we lead. And so one part about being a practitioner, uh, rather than a consultant, is, um, it's, it's like being um, a midwife or a surgeon um, where you are, you don't take direction on how to do something. Um, you just have common goals for what the end, end goal is. And so say like uh, Brandon, he had all his kids at home and had an amazing midwife um, who helped deliver all their kids. And part of that really risky experience um, and, and job at hand is saying, hey, look, as, as a midwife, I'm not here to help you. I'm here to make sure this goes as well as it can. And so for me to do that, um, I am, I'm in control. That's the, that's the only way that we can get to this end goal um, and, and have a healthy baby and a healthy mother um, at the end of the day. So you have to listen to me. And if you don't, I'm gonna leave. Um, because I can't be responsible for the outcomes if I can't control it. Um, and so that's a really tough, tough dynamic to, to work in. Um, and it takes a lot of context setting with people to say, hey, look, this is how we're going to make decisions together. Um, this is how we're going to work together. And the reason why we're going to work together is because it's to all of our benefit. Um, so you're going to have to trust us. Um, the second one, um, related to trust is we lead with process, not opinions. Um, so I cannot tell you what a bad um, justification for a decision is when you're um, contracting for someone and you're saying, hey, I'm smarter than you, or hey, I, I've done this a million times. Uh, it, it doesn't work. Um, nobody's, nobody's gonna like you after that. Um, and so with process, it's kind of a boring word, but it's become kind of one of our most favorite words, is 
Everything has a why. Everything that we do now every, and everything that's going to come after has a reason. And the reason is to collect data to inform the next decision so that we don't have to kind of throw opinions out on the table. We can all build consensus around what is the best next thing to do um, because we have a frame, uh, frame of reference for what, the, what, the, what we're doing together um, and we also have clear data so it doesn't really matter what I think or what matter what you think. What matters is we agree um, and we submit to the data, submit to the, um, submit to the market um, because that's, that's true. Um, and so that is uh, incredibly important because opinions are really fun to have. Um, I have plenty of them. Uh, and probably one of the biggest part of, uh, parts of my job is, is trying not to say them um, and saying, okay, it doesn't matter what I think, what should we do to answer this question? So the third one is we join a team and we join it forever, which kind of sounds weird. Um, but if you're leading a team of people um, and they think you're going to bail, they're not going to follow you. They're just not. Um, and so we, we actually take equity shares in, in companies not because we want some, like, we, we want to be billionaires, um, but we have to be tied. We have to be committed. Um, and we have to all share the same incentives and the same motivation. Um, and we have to commit to the end goal. Um, and you can't do that by just dropping in and, and bailing out um, and, and being the super smart guy in the room and be like, all right, uh, see you later. I, I did my part. Good luck. Um, we, you have to commit. Um, and it's, it's hard and it's scary um, and it's overwhelming um, because it's not just one team, it's a lot of teams. Um, so the fourth one, this is kind of the crazy one, is we pay ourselves. Um, meaning, our we don't ask our clients, um, hey, you've got to fund this whole thing, because they don't have any money. Um, and so they'll pay us a little bit of upfront money to get started. Um, but if, if this works, if it works, then it will lead to something successful. And so it's on us to help them raise money that pays us. Um, and so, uh, but say with insurance, if, if you knew, or if you knew you had a, a, a life-changing procedure, um, didn't have insurance, um, and didn't have the money to pay for it, and it was a million dollars, you just wouldn't do it. Um, or, or you would go bankrupt and, and ruin the rest of your life anyway. Um, so in this, we want to keep the, the, the bar as low as possible because the most important thing is we start this relationship. Um, we build this trust, we start working together because as soon as we do, it starts going really fast um, and it's really cool. Um, but it doesn't go anywhere if you don't start. Um, and so the most important thing is we say, hey, we're going to be on the line for paying ourselves. Uh, we're going to raise the money with you and then we'll get paid, um, but it, it, it's scary. Um, a lot of it is really scary because and it sounds kind of stupid because, yeah, why wouldn't you want to just like kind of pull out tens of thousands of dollars and just say, all right, I got mine, good luck. Um, but really, if, if you believe in the process and if you believe in, in what this is capable of and what you're capable of as a team with leadership and process, um, then there should be money at the end. There should be results. Um, so, if you haven't picked up on this, like, this is difficult. It's incredibly costly, mostly personally uh, costly, like having to, to be up late at night just fielding messages from people who are really worried about um, did they choose the wrong lawyer or something like that. Um, because we touch on everything. Like this is, this is a committed relationship. And, and um, so it's everything from accounting to uh, high level uh, software architecture um, and product documentation and marketing and uh, brand voice and logos and UI design. It's everything. Um, and so it's 
just super hard and it's incredibly costly from just energy because you, you can't, um, it, it's hard to slow down and, and, and re-energize. The other thing is it's super unscalable. Um, like what is scalable is writing a book about leadership. What's unscalable is being and making a great leader. That's super unscalable. Um, and so in this level of investment to get the outcomes that we all kind of dream of, we really dream of it and we see it, um, but we only see the successes and all the failures get hidden. Um, and so chasing after what an incredible outcome is, um, it's, it just feels really unscalable, but it's worth it. Um, because honestly, the, the other side, it, it, it's just not that exciting. Um, and it doesn't work. Um, and, and so why, why continue doing something that only works every once in a while if you're lucky? Um, and why not try doing something that actually might produce some outcomes? Um, so that's it.